Disrupting Japan, Episode 48. Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening. Crowdfunding in Japan is at a crossroads. It may or may not take the same path as crowdfunding in the U.S., but the end result is going to look very, very different. There is an inherent conflict of interest in the crowdfunding model, and crowdfunding companies around the world are being told to pick a side. You see, crowdfunding companies make money by taking a percentage of the funds raised by the projects on the site. It's a great model. The problem is that some of the most exciting, high-profile, and profitable crowdfunding campaigns are frankly scams. Exciting products from charismatic founders that capture people's imaginations but will never be delivered. Many crowdfunding companies are in danger of becoming the digital equivalent of online infomercials. Now, some companies have chosen sides. Kickstarter has changed itself into a public benefit corporation to prioritize quality projects over rapid growth. And Indiegogo has embraced the dark side, actively promoting products that will never be built, but making a lot of money doing it. In Japan, however, crowdfunding has grown more slowly than the U.S., and Japanese companies have had a chance to learn from their overseas successes and failures. Ryota Matsuzaki, the CEO of Kibidango, one of Japan's newest crowdfunding platforms, has a new approach, one that, while perhaps not unique to Japan, is certainly extremely well suited to Japan. But I don't want to give too much away. So let's get right to the interview. I'm sitting here with Ryota Matsuzaki of Kibidango, a leading Japanese crowdfunding service with an e-commerce focus. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of crowdfunding sites in Japan, so why don't you explain a bit more about Kibidango? What makes it special? What does it do? There are lots of crowdfunding you know, uh, platforms out here in Japan, but what we do very differently is we primarily focus on small businesses. Okay. We've seen many crowdfunding services that are good at helping NPOs with their charitable project and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Uh, we've seen many of the entertainment-based crowdfunding platforms, but what I see, I've seen many, many small businesses that has great ideas, yet their great ideas never sort of saw the light of the world, and uh, I just wanted to help them. Okay. You mentioned Rakuten, and you were there for, wow, 10 years or so, right? During mm -hmm. the really crazy growth times of Rakuten. Right. Do you see crowdfunding as kind of the, the new version of e-commerce? I mean, the way that e-commerce sort of changed consumers' buying habits 15 years ago. Is that what you see crowdfunding sort of turning into now? Absolutely. So what I see crowdfunding now is almost like an e-commerce in 1997 yeah. when Rakuten just uh, started. And the, the market itself was very, very marginal here in Japan. But that it's was... hard to believe, looking back on it, how, right. I, mean, I mean, the department stores were just saying, no one's ever going to buy something online. Exactly. We don't need to worry about this. Right. <laughs> and things have changed. What I see with crowdfunding is just, you know, what I saw e-commerce back in 1997. You know, everyone loves shopping online right mm -hmm. now. There are many great platforms that offer a great experiences. Right. But there isn't any service that uh, really gives the kind of excitement that I had when I first saw crowdfunding's platform in the U.S. Uh, it's uh, Kickstarter. Kickstarter, yeah. What you're buying is not necessarily the product with the cheapest price or a product that can be delivered the next day. Something that really, you know, excites you. Well, I, at least I was very excited to back many projects on Kickstarter. Well, it's certainly, there's, there's a much closer relationship with buyer and seller than a straight e-commerce company. So when, when was that? When did you decide that crowdfunding was the next thing? That was back in, I guess, early 2011. You know, it didn't take me long to start backing many, many projects. I mean, it's an interesting point you make. I think now e-commerce is mature enough that most e-commerce startups we see now are optimization, mm -hmm. right? They're 
how to increase conversion, how to improve your marketing. It, they're useful, but they're not game changing. But crowdfunding, much like e-commerce, when it was starting up in Japan, most people were very skeptical of it. Sure. Back in early 2012, I wanted to bring the Kickstarter into Japan. For the first question they had was because Japan doesn't have as much culture around donation or backing mm. um, culture. They weren't too sure if the crowdfunding itself would、uh, fly in Japan or you know would be as successful as it is in other places. But I had a very different view to it because everyone loves shopping、uh, right. here in Japan. And to me, the experience that I had with Kickstarter was somewhat similar to shopping experience. You are paying money. Of course, you know the product doesn't exist at that point. But then you will spend all that time waiting for that product to be delivered. You know, I guess it, it makes sense because once you move beyond just a commodity product, you're buying an experience,、yes. right? Whether you're buying a Chanel bag,、uh, whether you're buying a、um, Tesla car.、Mm -hmm. You're not just buying the physical good. You're buying a whole experience and idea around that good. Right, and you are no longer buying a product just because it's features and functionalities, but you're buying it because you're feeling、uh, empathy to someone who's running the business or、hmm. who's making the product.、Uh, maybe it's only me, but I really want to talk to many people who's making things, and I, I think those are story, stories that has, actually has value. Crowdfunding certainly has taken root in Japan. In six years span, it's gone from the general consensus that no one would be interested to、uh, I think there's like more than fifty crowdfunding sites in Japan.、Now. Right. Was it was it there anything in particular that changed, or was it simply that once Japanese consumers experienced it, they enjoyed it just like? Americans and Europeans do. I would say that's still not there yet. I, I think、uh, it's getting there, but it's not quite there yet. Kickstarter itself did about two point four billion, I guess, in the past. Right.、Um, whereas, if you put those fifty companies together, we're only doing probably less than hundred million. So, do you think that is just because crowdfunding is newer in Japan, or do you think that do you think it will eventually grow to be as big as Kickstarter and Indiegogo in the states? So I think it's a great question、um, that no one knows the answer. <laughs>、uh, one of the challenge with crowdfunding itself is the the word crowdfunding. I, it does not explain what Kibidango is or what Kickstarter is. We're not just raising money from crowd. It's it's more of a joint effort by the community who's behind the project creators or who's behind us. Well, so let's let's talk about Kibidango sure, in, sure. in particular. With so many crowdfunding sites in Japan, and some of them are very general, and some of them are really tightly focused on a niche. What are you guys doing that's that's different? In terms of feature and functionality, we're not that different, right? Oh, sure. I mean,、um, but everyone's kind of the same, right? Right. So, what's different is most of the platforms, I believe,、uh, really focus on the single campaign. We really try to focus on. Making each of the creators successful in the long run. The first campaign is only the beginning of the the long sort of mission that they are at, going after.、Huh. So, so how do you do that? We really spend time、uh, with each of the project creators to、uh, make their first project successful. That's why we have more than eighty percent success rate. So, when you say、platform. a success rate, do you mean eighty percent is funded or eighty percent deliver a product? Eighty percent is funded. Okay. What what percent deliver a product? A hundred percent so far. So really, that's fantastic. Yes,、yeah, so everyone so, is funded is delivered. That's <laughs> that's astounding. <laughs> sure.、Um, you know, we have a very generous guideline, so we let anyone sort of you know launch a campaign. Sure. But one thing、uh, we really try to make sure is that they have appropriate skills、mm -hmm. and resources to deliver the product or services that they promised. So how do you do that vetting? Uh, basically, we interview everyone. We meet everyone. We try to do reference check. We try、wow. to sort of, you know, get into the details of who's going to make the product or how, and so on and so, so forth. So you like meet in person? Yes. Wow. Okay. That that would seem to limit. I mean, it, it's interesting. I'm two minds of that. So I'm of two minds on that. So on one hand, that's going to absolutely keep your success rate high and the quality high. But it seems like that's going to really slow down growth of the platform. Yes, that's true. But you know, we just want to make sure that people who's backing the product will 
get the product? Well, I think from, from a crowdfunding company's point of view, there is this dilemma. Mm -hmm. Some companies have tried to be very strict and tried to turn down projects that they think have a low chance of success. Some companies like, uh, well, Indiegogo is probably the famous, most mm -hmm. famous for it, are perfectly happy to back projects and promote projects that there's almost no way they can deliver. Right. <laughs> because, I mean, they make money on it, right? right? They make a percentage. It's very hard to turn down money when you're it, trying to grow. It's a big challenge for us as well. We, of course, would like to see more volumes, but at the same time, we like to make sure the creators or the, each of the businesses will get excited that they were able to successfully raise that money and be able to deliver the project that they can come back to us and sort of, you know, continue on. So you're we, looking for repeat business. Exactly. Right. We try to really focus our KPIs around how many times each of the project owners have actually launched project. So one of the, the more successful project owners is in the middle of raising money for her sixth project. Japanese consumers are famous worldwide for just being incredibly detail-oriented mm -hmm. and incredibly intolerant of mistakes. Has this ever caused a problem with the crowdfunding campaigns? I mean, do... That's a great question, both for project owners and uh, for consumers. Many of our project owners also happen to own their own like online stores, mm -hmm. for example, on Rakuten. And what they are really surprised and telling us is that the consumer's attitude are completely different when they're selling something on Rakuten and when they're uh, raising money on Kibidango. Really? Right, so if you are late delivering a product for a day on an online store, you'll see lots of complaints coming in, right? Whereas with Kibidango, there are projects that cannot deliver on time and then you know, deliver late for about one month or you know, uh, sometimes a couple months. But when they are open about that and uh, they sort of you know, try to explain what happened, people react very differently. People are really... Why is that? Why do you uh, it's, think? It's, you know, so that's when I see that they're not just consumers, just paying for a product. So it's that, do you think it's that personal connection yes. they have with the backers? The, each of the backers actually become involved in the project itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was interesting for me to hear from one of the backers. You know, he backed many of projects on Kibidango. This guy was saying that when product got delayed, he was saying that it was my ability to screen the right product wasn't there. So it was like, you know, it was his fault that the, huh. the, he chose the you know, the project that got delayed. Wow, that is a really different reaction right. than an e-commerce situation. Exactly. So, you know, if this is the right kind of backers because he's really trying to carefully pick and choose the right project for him or her. Do you think this is, I mean, this is a, a great situation, mm -hmm. but in, in the States, we saw the same trajectory. Mm -hmm. Early on, there were this close relationship between backers and, and makers. And then as the projects got bigger and bigger, the money involved got larger and larger. Right. Large companies started using it. Uh, scammers started using it. And right now, there's this real friction. I, I think a lot of that trust and innocence and, and connection is, is being lost. Do you think that crowdfunding in Japan is going to face the same challenges? Or do you think that there's something unique about this market that will allow it to maintain that personal connection? I think it's still a big challenge for everyone. Um, there are lots of platforms out there, and many of them have very different agenda. While we can maintain and focus on making every project successful and you know, making, you know, empowering each of the businesses, I think it's our responsibility to uh, grow this market the way it should be. Mm. And I, I think, you know, to a certain extent, we've seen some of the successes and some of the failures outside of Japan that uh, really try to uh, scale their businesses. And I, I think we really need to and really learn from their experiences. We need to make every project in the right way. In terms of the industry as a whole, do you think that we'll see a future where crowdfunding in Japan is much smaller, but perhaps more trusted than crowdfunding in America? Or do you think that crowdfunding in Japan will scale up to proportionally the same size and the same types of problems that we've seen in the US and Europe? I certainly see that latter to happen. So mm -hmm. it would definitely scale. 
uh, but with all the kind of challenges and problems, and we will need to face that uh, going forward. And one of the concerns that I have is that crowdfunding will become uh, just another buzzword. And、yeah. uh, when it becomes a buzzword, it's you know Japanese are very easy to forget, get through those. They do follow trends very. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that's the, one of the concern because. Many of the people have started to use crowdfunding not to accomplish what they're, you know, something that they cannot accomplish themselves, but more or less、uh, just a marketing campaign. Well, yeah, this has started to happen a lot in Japan now. Right. Not only with small startups using it for marketing, but like Sony has been very active. Right. In using crowdfunding to launch products. Sony doing crowdfunding, it's、uh, has its own merits. I think it's actually great. It's not, you know, that Sony doesn't have the, the financial resources to make that happen. <laughs>、right. it's, it's it's the younger sort of entrepreneurs、uh, inside organization that wants to build lots of interesting product, but that didn't get an endorsement from the senior management. Obviously, the program has endorsement because、right. Sony's doing a lot of this. So, what do they want out of this? Is this Product marketing for them is it? Or is it market research? What are, what are, what's their goal in their I, I use of crowdfunding? I think for Sony,、uh, they want to see if the consumers are backing the idea or not. It's more of a how do you say approval process without their、uh, senior management involvement. Okay, it's more of an approval process by the consumers. It makes sense for Sony. Well, I, I think it certainly makes sense for Sony. Right. But do you think having companies like Sony or Pioneer or Panasonic involved in this changes the nature of crowdfunding. Yeah, actually, it、uh, could. The kind of crowdfunding that Sony or Panasonic may do, and the kind of crowdfunding that we do, empowering small businesses, could be completely different.、Mm. But、uh, overall, I guess the idea of having all the financial support or sort of backing from consumers way before the product is actually born is actually something in common, and that. Both the small businesses and large businesses can actually benefit from. Okay, there is one thing that kind of occurs to me that it might not work out too well for Sony or the big companies that are using this for test marketing because all of these big brands—they're not using their brands.、Um, they're not using really marketing dollars. It's a a tiny little team、mm-hmm. launching on crowdfunding. I think with enough successes, a lot of these tiny little teams will realize that they don't need the big company. Behind them, and they might just go out and start their own companies. That could actually be a very interesting sort of you know evolution if we are going to see that happen. Someone like Sony should encourage that kind of evolution、mm. because in the end, if it was the company who had helped all those small teams to be successful, there should be some you know ongoing relationship even after they moved on and started their own businesses. It's certainly going to be interesting、right. <laughs> to see how things、right. change in the next decade or so. Have we seen a case either on Kibidango or、mm-hmm. another crowdfunding site where a large company has picked up a product for distribution? Yes. So it's a great question. We had a project, a camera bag. It's a camera bag that acts more like a messenger bag. Very easy to carry、uh, when you're、uh, riding a bike. Easy to take take your camera and shoot pictures.、Huh. They had a really successful Kibidango、uh, crowdfunding campaign. And because of that, the media picked up and wrote an article. The one of the biggest consumer electronics retailer called the project creator and asked if they would be able to carry that product. Fantastic! And that's I think it's、uh, one of the good example of us being able to help small startups connect with large retailers. Well, I think that right now Japan's consumer electronics industry is has got a real problem with product development. It's they made such amazing products the '60s, '70s, early '80s, but recently their internal research just isn't turning out good products. So it would be wonderful if the large Japanese consumer electronics companies and other companies could actually start looking at crowdfunding as an alternative to their own R&D. Right. I think that'll be great if、uh, large companies start sort of looking at each of the teams, small teams, and be able to work together either as a license or sort of you know aqua hire and so on. It'd be great. I think that the large companies have a lot of pride, though.、Mm-hmm. Do you think they'll be able to kind of、uh, get past their pride and and start looking at these creators as a source of R and D, as a source of new products? We'll see. I, I think there are a couple of small startups that has started to to launch mini project over crowdfunding campaigns. Could be a potential an opportunity for large companies to 
get that sort of you know design product design expertise through acquisitions. The, the U.S. in particular is U.S. corporations are very comfortable using M and A to mm -hmm. supplement their products sure. and their R and D. I, I think it's still very it's a very new concept for most Japanese companies. It is. Uh, we don't see as many exit opportunities mm. for small startups here in Japan, and that's uh, definitely right. I used to lead the corporate development effort at Rakuten, but there aren't as many companies like Rakuten who is really aggressive on acquisition. Sort of the new generation of companies right. that came up after 2000 are very aggressive, whether it's Rakuten or GRI or yes. DNA, but the older ones haven't gotten on board with that yet. Well, I think it has something to do with the corporate culture and mm. the way they see the acquisition and have had a very negative notion to it. So Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, traditionally acquisitions, you bought distressed companies, you bought right. companies that were in trouble. Right, exactly. For any uh, startups, acquisition is actually a success story. Well, let me ask you to pull out your crystal ball for a moment. Sure. Because there's one aspect of crowdfunding that I think is very interesting in Japan. And I know Kibidango doesn't do this. Last month, the U.S. government legalized crowdfunding for equity. Right. Now, this is one of those rare things that Japan was actually ahead of the U.S. in. In that the Japanese government legalized this uh, two years ago, 2014, I think. Now, it hasn't really caught on here in Japan. But... Do you think crowdfunding for equity is, is a good thing? Do you think it will be a, a positive result for society? Or do you think it's going to result in more of scam type companies coming out? It could go either, you know, great or uh, awful. I mean, you know, it could be, you know, go both ways. One of the challenge for equity-based crowdfunding is that if you are a venture capitalist, you will know that the companies you're sort of making investment may sort of be successful and see great exit if you're lucky. Right. So one out of 10 companies, you know, you may be able to see a great exit. But um, the retail investors are not accustomed to that kind of risk return. They've been sort of, you know, investing in stock market, which is regulated and they have uh, right. great, you know, disclosures and so but on and so forth. In, in that way, it is very similar to product-based crowdfunding where the, the consumers at first weren't used to the idea that they might not get the product or it might not be exactly what they have. And the consumers have taken to that. Yes and no. So for reward-based crowdfunding, the amount of money you're putting in is going to be relatively similar to the price of the product. So uh, true, you know, true. the average price would be around $100. Whereas for equity-based crowdfunding, you're talking about $5,000 on investment. It's not going to be the same as you're buying a product That's or true. you're backing yeah. a project on Kibidango or Kickstarter. So both the level and the expectations exactly. are really different. Exactly. Mm. And you know, you're usually talking about someone who has not really been a professional investor. Well, see, this is my concern that it might open it up to an awful lot of scams. Yes. Well... Uh, it's very easy for you to get into that kind of situation where people are casually raising money and people are uh, casually making all the promises which will not be fulfilled. So the idea is you will need to have an investor who's uh, sophisticated enough to make their own risk-reward judgment. Uh, but I just don't see that anytime soon. Yeah? So you think it'll, you, you are not optimistic about it? I, I'm... I'm not optimistic to see the market to really be growing in the right way. Okay. All right. Well, let me ask you a different question, because you're also a very active investor mm -hmm. here in Japan. Uh, you've had a number of very different types of investments. You were invested in uh, Crowdworks, I believe, mm -hmm. and Otaku Mode, which is um, e-commerce and uh, crowdsourcing, respectively. What do you think is the most attractive area in Japanese startups today? You know, the reason why I made those investments is not necessarily I had like a really sort of smart idea or anything like that. I just, you know, get to know those people. And uh -huh. I really loved the team who's behind it and their sort of, you know, whole idea about uh, making changes to the world. And so it, it was more of knowing the team and having the opportunity right. and, rather you know, than some finding, high level strategy. Finding my way to put a skin in the game, I guess. Uh, I really want to help people with great ideas. And when I want to help them, 
we can make all the sort of you know random comments and advices to those entrepreneurs but what makes you more convincing than you know other sort of way is to actually put your money into the business and uh, right. then to make the advices and to make all the introduction it doesn't really uh, matter how much you're putting in if you're putting money in you, it means that you are really sort of you know behind the idea of well, it's a commitment team. it's a commitment exactly I want to ask you what I call my magic wand question. Sure. And that's if I gave you a magic wand and I told you you could change anything about Japan, Japanese society, its educational system, the attitude towards risk, anything at all to make it better for startups in Japan, what would you change? I think Japan has a very, very good culture. People here are generally really, really hardworking. Many people tell me that I look different when I'm talking in English uh, <laughs> as a, compared to when I'm talking in Japanese. I, I, they tell me that too. True. It's, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, one thing that I would like to see happen is that when you are in the sort of global setting, I want to see everyone have more confidence in what they do. And you know, what I always feel that is that people in Japan or companies in Japan, there are so many great people, so many great ideas, so many great products here. So, so you, it just means you want individuals to be more assertive or, or more willing to talk about the good things that they're doing? They sh should have more confidence in what they do, hmm. not just within the, you know, the Japanese market, but what they need is the confidence and willingness to think beyond their, the Japanese border and the Japanese culture setting or cultural framework. So I do guess. you mean just the, just the confidence to enter overseas markets or the kind of self-confidence that what they're building is suitable for overseas markets without changes or what practically, what do you mean? So just try to um, have their ideas, either their product or services, be known to other parts of the world. So that may mean yeah. that you will need to start communicating in English languages or other languages, you will need to make that effort so that more people will find you. But because Japan, you know, Japanese market is the third largest market uh, in the world, many people are too um, comfortable, I guess, being in this market. I think so. This is a, this is a theme that so many of our guests talk about, mm. that in the 60s and 70s, Japanese companies had to go overseas. Right. There was no choice. The only way you could survive was to go overseas. And in the 80s and the 90s, Japan kind of got lazy. It had a huge profitable domestic market and focused on it. But I do think from the startups I talk to, I think there's a much greater awareness of overseas markets. It still seems to be sort of an abstract concept. Mm the number of Japanese companies that actually have the guts and the financial backing to go overseas, it's a very small percentage. Part of the reason is the disconnect between the Japanese entrepreneurs and the financial resources outside of Japan. So, you know, there are many startups that get funded by the Japanese VCs, yeah. but not by VCs outside of Japan. Is that changing? Because... I mean, VCs in Europe and San Francisco are always talking about global investments and the importance of a global portfolio. But on the ground, in real life here, do you think the foreign VCs are having much of an impact at all on the situation? The very few examples of that kind of sort of, you know, venture capital is someone like, you know, 500 startups. Yeah, they're right? very aggressive. Right. So uh, the model of venture capital is also evolving. And I think there are still a very small number of them. But uh, there are certain VCs that are sort of thinking outside of their local sort of community. So maybe they're just skipping Japan and going to like, you know, Southeast Asia or Chinese market. Uh, but well, I, a lot I think of them you know, are, yeah. if the idea is great, then they should definitely look into the Japanese market. And, you know, I, I think Japanese entrepreneurs haven't done the, their job to really make that happen or uh, show the ideas to the people outside of Japan. So you think the, the Japanese founders themselves should make a greater effort to appeal yes. to global capital? Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It seems like that's starting to happen now, and hopefully mm -hmm. we'll see more and more of that right. in the future. Exactly. 
And I think, you know, you will need to have a certain role model. If there is a company that has been successfully able to get funding from outside of Japan, because of that, their, you know, business has have been able to grow internationally. I, I think, you know, then well, people will start to take the last, a second role. In the last couple of years, we've seen um, a dozen, two dozen companies that have left Japan and moved to San Francisco. Right. And successfully raised money there. Right. So it seems like the trend is, it's starting I think so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, listen, thanks so much for sitting down with me. Well, thanks so much. It was、uh, great talking to you. Likewise. And we're back. It's no surprise that Ryota and Kibidango have chosen slower growth and higher quality. It's a rare Japanese company that makes the opposite trade off. What I found interesting was the effort put into creating long term relationships. Now, obviously, all crowdfunding sites want repeat business, but few Western companies are willing to make the kind of investment that Kibidango is making. Interviewing people in person, working with them one on one on sourcing and managing expectations, and gaining the support of their backers. Kibidango is clearly focused on building a real community. Now, that might, and it probably will, limit their growth. Both in the short term and in terms of their ultimate size. But that's a decision they've made carefully and consciously. As to whether large Japanese companies will start looking to small startups and crowdfunding as a source of product development and MA, well, they really need to. And the talent is out there and can be bought cheap. But corporate culture can be hard to change here in Japan. Of course, we're seeing the very first baby steps in that direction today, so there's certainly hope that these trends will accelerate. If you've run or backed a crowdfunding campaign in Japan, Ryota and I would love to hear what you thought of it. So come by disruptingjapan.com slash show 048 and let us know what you think. And when you drop by, you'll find all the links and sites that Ryota and I talked about, and much, much more in the resources section of the post. And most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.